The transatlantic slave trade, also known as the triangular trade, saw European goods, such as guns, clothes and alcohol, traded for African peoples who were cast as property to be bartered. Typically already enslaved by local merchants and rulers, these African men, women and children were often prisoners of war or had been kidnapped for this purpose. Having by now been doubly enslaved, these dehumanised persons were transported in horrific conditions to the Americas, there to be sold by auction into lives of back-breaking work in households, on plantations and other industries. The products of their labour, which included labour-intensive crops like sugar and cotton, were then traded with Europe and in tragic irony, sometimes even with African kingdoms and merchants. In both their transportation and subsequent lives in the Americas, the enslaved were treated as property, deprived of their most basic rights, and often subjected to cruel and dehumanizing treatment. Spanning five centuries and three continents, this trade resulted in at least 12 million Africans being forcibly transported to the Americas, at least a third of them on British ships, many of which were specifically designed for this purpose. As many as two million died during the journey. Ships registered at Liverpool were responsible for transporting over 1.3 million enslaved Africans, those at London, 826,000, and Bristol, over 500,000. John Newton, who would later become an Anglican minister, celebrated hymn writer, and a prominent abolitionist, was involved in the slave trade from 1745 and began working on slave ships in 1748. In his authentic narrative, he reflected on his work as first mate on the Brownlow. My business in this voyage, while upon the coast, was to sail from place to place in the long boat to purchase slaves. In 1750, Newton became captain of a slave ship. His journal, Letters to His Wife, and biography record his three journeys as a captain aboard the Duke of Argyle and the African in great detail. Each journey began in England, with ships making their first stop on the west coast. Newton wrote to his wife in 1753 of his dealings with a local seller on the west coast of Africa. This man had several factories, as these trading posts were called, in different places, particularly one in Kitam. It was in such a slave factory that Oluwada Equiano, a prominent African abolitionist, had been imprisoned after having been kidnapped in 1756 as a child from his home while his family worked in the fields. Equiano later remarked in his biography that kidnapping and taking prisoners of war were the two main measures by which Africans were enslaved. In regions increasingly destabilized by European colonial power, African merchants and rulers soon perceived there was considerable profit to be made by slave trading with Europeans. Sometimes this resulted in local conflicts being pursued in order to provide prisoners of war to feed European demands for cheap labour. As Newton observed, I verily believe that the far greater part of the wars in Africa would cease if the Europeans would cease to tempt them by offering goods for slaves. Once captured and sold to Europeans, the Africans were then taken to a ship destined for the Americas. At Criano recalled, the stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. So vile were these conditions that Africans attempted to fling themselves from the ship, but were prevented by doing so by the crew. Equiano entertained these thoughts himself. I would have jumped over the side, but I could not. And besides, the crew used to watch us very closely. After a long, deadly journey, in disease-ridden and cramped conditions, the enslaved were sold again at the market. Equiano again described this experience. 
We were conducted immediately to the merchant's yard, where we were all pent up together, like so many sheep in a fold, without regard to sex or age. On a signal given, such as the beat of a drum, the buyers rush at once to the yard and make their choice of that parcel they like best. Once the enslaved had been disembarked, the ships made their journeys back to their home port, sometimes with new goods to sell on return. Beeswax, wood, sugar, rum, cotton, and gold were popular. As for John Newton, he continued to work in the slave trade until an illness made it impossible for him to return to sea. His journal suggests this may have been a welcome departure. Thus I was brought out of a way of life disagreeable to my temper and inconvenient to my profession of my Christian faith. It is important to note that Newton's decision to depart from the slave trade was not a moral decision at this point, but a practical one. His moral repulsion with this practice was yet to come. Newton and Equiano's direct knowledge of the trade from their opposite experiences made their contributions to the abolitionist cause particularly powerful. Perhaps more than many of the prominent abolitionists, they knew firsthand the full extent of its inhumanity.